right, let's open with a word of prayer tonight. If you need this evening's lesson sheet, it's there at the Welcome Center, or you can find it online, either one. Um, so make sure you have that for tonight. It says 2 John, it should say lesson number two, has today's date as well. So make sure you have that, and we'll go over some of these uh, prayer requests in just a little while. So let's open with a word of prayer tonight. Thank the Lord for allowing us to be together and to have his word in front of us. Lord, we are grateful that we can uh, gather together in your name, <clears throat> and we know that you are pleased when your people pray, and you're pleased when we speak to you, you are pleased when we worship you and sing um, of your glory and of your name. So may we do that in our hearts tonight, as uh, the song says, may we be in tune, may our heart be in tune to sing your praise. So remove from us tonight the distractions and the, um, the difficulties in our minds and um, the stresses of life for a moment. And may we focus on your word because it is what you have spoken to us and we praise you for it. Uh, be with our time together tonight. Be with those that can't be here. We ask that you bless them, encourage them in your word and those that we will be praying over tonight. May they uh, know and be encouraged that their church is carrying their burden to the Lord in prayer. And as we do that in just a little while, hopefully we don't take that for granted. We ask that you would teach it uh, to us, the privilege that it is to come to you in prayer. Uh, we ask that you guide and direct us, and we praise you for your love in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand. <clears throat> And as you are seated, if you would, find your place in the second epistle, the second letter of John. Some call it Second John. If you're from England, you call it Two John. Whatever you call it tonight, find your place there. Near the end of Scripture, the second epistle of John. And uh, I did not tell you a chapter again tonight because there is only one. It's a fairly brief passage of Scripture. It's a fairly short book of Scripture, in fact. It is less than 250 Greek words, making it the shortest uh, book in the New Testament or in Scripture as a whole. And so we began our study in Second John last week, and we will continue there Tonight, just a short study, a couple weeks, but it's important uh, not to ignore Scripture based on its brevity or our familiarity with it, or even its repetition. We called our attention to the fact last week that about seven out of the 13 verses, or if you want to break it down into longer phrases, about half, just a little more than half of this second letter that John is writing it is not an exact quote from 1 John, but more than half of it is direct wording, direct concept and wording from the book of 1 John. So as you read through 2 John, our tendency in our mind can kind of be like, oh, well, he just said that, especially if you read them back to back. Oh, he just said that. It's the same thing. And so sometimes we tend to uh, maybe unintentionally ignore or breeze through a passage of Scripture like 2 John for a number of reasons. But we noted last week that what separates 2 John and makes it distinct from 1 John is how and who it is addressed toward. And you see there in the very first verse, it says, the elder, that's what John calls himself, unto the elect lady and her children. We said last week that it is addressed to an individual and her family. Now, we mentioned last week that there's some credence or discussion that can be given. Is he addressing a church or is he addressing an individual? And there's some support for both of those. But the truth is, it does not affect the way that we interpret the book, really, either way that it is addressed. I said, I, I tend to believe that it is as straightforward as he is addressing it. It doesn't really give us any inclination that he's not talking to an individual. And if you read the last verse, in the first verse it says, the elder to the lady and her children. The last verse says, the children of thy elect sister greet thee. And so it would be odd to address and speak to one church 
and say, I'm writing to you, lady, the church, and by the way, the children of this other church greet you. It's just kind of, it would be odd language. It seems like he would keep that consistent and refer to both as the lady. And there's not, there's precedent that the church is called the bride of Christ. It's referred to in a feminine way. The word that is used for church throughout the New Testament has, if grammatically has a feminine ending. But there's really not really any inclination given to us here that this is not written to an individual. And it would make sense that what John writes in his first letter to the church as a whole, now he reinforces and addresses to one particular person, maybe even from within the same church. Uh, tradition or uh, Christian thought, especially early on, has it that he's writing particularly to the church at Ephesus in 1 John. It's, the letter spreads all throughout the world at that point and to many Christians and many groups of Christians and churches, but particularly I think John had in mind the church at Ephesus for a number of reasons. That's a church he was directly tied to outside of the church at Jerusalem. And then it's thought that this lady that he's addressing here may have even been an individual within that church. And so now he is addressing some of the same concept that he gave us in 1 John, but he's addressing it in a more specific manner, and he's actually applying it to her personally. He's applying it to a circumstance in her life. And we said last week that that circumstance, just sort of off the bat, we'll read it again in a moment, but that that circumstance had to do with bringing in and welcoming, and we'll say it this way, supporting false teachers, teachers that were not teaching the Christ of Scripture, that were not teaching the Godhead or the deity of Jesus or separating his deity and his humanity, and they were not teaching the gospel. And so what we have in this is a warning to her about how she is handling these false teachers and her relationship with them. And But we noted last week, we took a little bit of time and set aside. So you have a woman that it seems has aligned herself with something that is incorrect. She has attached herself to a group of people, not that are just teaching some small difference, but that are denying certain core aspects of Jesus as the Son of God incarnate on this earth, come to be the Redeemer, fully God and fully man. And so you have these people that are denying that, and she has attached herself to them and is even supporting them in, in a way, allowing her influence, their influence on her life. Maybe it's unwillingly, maybe it's kind of subconsciously, but it's an issue and it's a problem. And so what we really focused on last week is how did John address this woman that has attached herself to something that you could just say just very simply that is wrong? How did he address her? How did he speak to her? How did he handle his relationship with her? And I want you to remind us of those, if you would. And let's look back through the first four verses, and then we're going to tackle the rest of the passage tonight. But notice, if you would, verse number one. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found the, of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. So we put there in your notes just a reminder of the things that we pointed out last week. How did he approach someone who was in error or in her life had attached herself to significant error when he realizes though that she is a believer this is his sister in christ she's not proselytizing some false gospel she is not blaspheming the lord she has made let's just simplify she has made a mistake how does he handle this situation look notice number one he encourages her in who she is we pointed that out in verse number one. He says, you're an elect lady, you are chosen, you are a child of God. And he says, who I love in the truth. So he says, God loves you, I love you. And then he says, and the church loves you. 
So in addressing this woman who's made a mistake, he encourages her in who she is and her relationship to God and to Christians. Number two, he gives confidence that the issue can be corrected. In verse number two, he says, for the truth's sake that dwells in us, God has given us truth whereby we can know him, whereby we can figure this out. Number three, he speaks of the permanence of their relationship in Christ. He says, grace be with you, mercy and peace. But then he doesn't say, if you get this right, if you change, if you figure this out, if you agree that I'm right. He just says, you have those things in God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. And then the final thing, he shows joy in the growth that has been experienced in her own life, but particularly in her children, that they're walking in truth. And so he doesn't have to enter into this situation combative. I think sometimes we do that in our minds if we want to approach someone that is in error. And here is the truth. We as Christians are called to lift each other up. I think sometimes in the modern setting of the modern day church, we we err on one side or the other. We approach people in a combative way about a, a mistake or a spiritual issue or even sin in someone's life. We, we approach in a combative way like we have to win. Or our other mistake is that we don't approach at all because we say, well, this is someone else's spiritual life. It's their decision. It's their personal reasoning between them and the Lord. And while there are elements of that are, that are true, there's also a lot of influence of our culture and society today which says anything beyond what you can see belongs to somebody else. That just, just let them deal with that. But the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. The Bible says that as Christians we are called to love one another and to love each other in the truth and by the truth. So let's look at the rest of the passage. Verse 5. How does he now handle this issue? And now I beseech thee, lady... Not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves, that we lose not the things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. Lord, help us this evening as we look to your word again to recognize the importance of truth and then tonight also the importance of love and that we are to be guided by your truth. We are to be motivated and driven by your love first to us, and then now our love in return to others. So may you give us wisdom as we approach this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to look at this passage again. We're just going to walk through. We are going to finish out this book this evening. And I want you to look. We're mainly going to focus verse number 5 down through verse 13. Verse number 4, we'll include a little bit of that. Notice he says, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children... Walking in truth, the, where it says of thy children, it literally means certain of or out of your children. There's, there's ones of your children, he says, that are walking in truth. Whether he's indicating there that there's some that are not or some that are, but he's, he's saying of your children, I see them walking in truth. But I want you to notice number one tonight as we look that we're to be guided by truth. I want you to notice that John rejoiced that some of the children, I want you to notice that phrase, walking in truth. And it's important to note that the, the Bible is not just an intellectual book. It is God's truth to us. It's what he's communicated about himself. It is how God intends for mankind to live and handle 
his world and his creation and each other and society and the stress. He gives us all of this truth in his word. It's what he has spoken to us. But it is not just intellectual or informational, meaning it's, it's not just for us to know. It is supposed to be influential. It's supposed to change us. We're not called just to know the truth. We are called to live that truth. Now, there are certain subjects in certain classes, even if you go to, into our school, particularly when you get up into the high school and you, you get you got chemistry and anatomy and um, calculus and all the different math classes and that kind of thing. And, and some of those students, students close your ears for a second, some of the students are going to use those principles specifically in their jobs the rest of their lives. Some of them will not. I know that it's opposed to what most teachers say. Now, there are principles and guiding patterns and structures. Let me just preface with all of that. But, I don't know about you, I have mixed very few chemicals since high school. I know a few. Now, sometimes just for fun, sometimes just to see if I can make a little boom or fizz or foam or whatever in the house with the kids to be fun. But I'm not doing that on a regular basis. Like when my family is sick or, you know, you come to me, one of you said, I, I haven't been feeling well. Like I don't go back to my office and mix and match certain things and say, drink this, you'll feel better. There's a good reason that I had to, I gained the information, but it really doesn't affect or influence my life on a daily basis. The Bible's never supposed to be that way. But one of the issues that we have as Christians sometimes is we treat the Bible like we do chemistry. Like we know and remember a few novel things, enough to make a mess and an explosion. You know, baking soda, vinegar, whatever it is, mix those up. Ooh, wow. But it doesn't change our everyday lives. Notice he says walking in truth. That is step by step by step. The Christian life is not taking a few steps or jumps. It's not marching or running to a certain place and then standing and rejoicing that you've made it in your Christian life. It's not just avoiding the pitfalls and the ditches along the way. The Christian life is getting up and daily moving and walking toward the Lord in obedience to Him. You know, it's this persisting forward with the full and perfect Word of God, not just parts of it, but we're to live in harmony with the truth that we find in God's Word. Let me just ask you a personal application question. How different would you have lived your life today if you did not have the Bible? Now, you may have some general moral uh, systems in your mind or accepted patterns of moral aptitude that's, that's placed into your life by society or culture or what is accepted. But did we walk through today making conscious decisions to obey how God has told us to handle our lives? Is the Bible informational or is it influential in our lives? Then notice, so John makes this appeal. The truth should affect your life daily. Walk in it. But then he gives this exhortation that we should love one another. And why is John making this emphasis? You see it there in verse 5. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto you. I think what he's referencing there is not only is he not, is he saying, I'm not writing a new commandment that is separate from the Bible or Jesus or the Old Testament or the law or what you have in the gospel accounts at this point. I think he is even pointing back to the book of 1 John. I'm not writing something different to you than I'm writing to the rest of the church. His expectation for this one Christian was not different than his expectation for all Christians. And notice he says, I didn't write a new commandment, uh, but that which we had known from the beginning, that we love one another. Just for quick reference, we gave you a few. There's more. First John, he already emphasized this in his first letter. I think this is what he's referring back to. First John 2, 7. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning, what is it, verse 11, but he that hateth, it, or excuse me, verse 10, he that loveth his brother abideth in the light. There is none occasion of stumbling in him, but he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness, knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness has blinded 
his eyes. He says you cannot be in love with your God and still be at odds consciously on your part with men in an active way, meaning I'm against others. Chapter 3, verse 14, speaking of his brethren, we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He says here's how we know that we've moved from being dead to being Christians because we love other Christians. We love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. He's living as though he were not saved. First John 4, 20. If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? This commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So he speaks to her this command that he's already given, this thought that he's already given in First John. And what is it? that we should love one another. It's a command that's given even by Jesus himself on a number of places in Scripture. You have it there where John himself in his own gospel account includes the teachings of Jesus. So what does that show us in John 13 and 15 where John says that Jesus teaches to love one another. Hereby will men know that you're my disciples and that you have love one for another. What is he saying? John didn't just invent this. You should love one another concept. Jesus gave it to his apostles, and now they are giving it to others. So what does that have to do with the issue and the mistake that this woman has made? Notice what he says in verse number six. And this is love. So here's what he does. In verse five, he says, here's a command, love one another. And then in verse six, he says, and here is how you love one another. Here is how that's demonstrated. It's not just in what you feel. It's in how you live and what you do. How do you then love your brothers and sisters in Christ? Notice verse 6. It's kind of interesting. This is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. So what is he saying? He says love is best demonstrated by obedience to the commands of God. Maybe one page over for you, 1 John chapter 5, verse number 2. Notice this phrase, it's very poignant, very uh, succinct statement that John makes in ch chapter 5, verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. See how it all ties together and it's circular. He says you don't love God and obey him and separately love and show love to others. You love God because he first loved you. And you love others because God loved you. And you love others by loving God and obeying his commands. And you show love to God by obeying commands and loving others. And you love others by obeying God's commands and loving him. You see how it all just continually points one to the next. He says, here's how you love others. Not by just accepting, not by just giving something to them, not by just how you feel, not by uh, 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 what you say to them, even though all those things can be included in this. You love others by first obeying God's commands. Now that is an interesting concept, isn't it? Actually, I, I would say that there might not be any more startling or different concept to how the world tells us we should love each other or love others, there, there's not much more startling difference than that. How do I love you? How do you love me? How do we love each other? We obey God above all things. And that's how I display love to each other. Think about, I love my kids after Wednesday nights. A lot of times I will stay through, and so I haven't seen them in the afternoon, so this afternoon I stayed through. If, if tonight is like most other nights, generally one, two, usually three of them will ask if they can ride home with me. I haven't seen me today, and so I say, yeah, let's go get in the truck and let's go home, and they'll jump in and they'll ride. Now, I love them. They want to sit you know, at different ages. Ellie's gotten old enough that she can sit in the front seat. Lex wants to sit in the front seat, and he asks me sometimes, can I sit in the front seat? And I love him, but I don't let him because it's not good for him, because it's against the rules. <laughs> it's against the law. I'll get in trouble. 
You know, they, they have certain seats that they have to sit in to a certain age, and there's booster seats and different things like that, and, and car seats, and they have to face certain ways and strap in different points, and there's lasers that have to, and there's not lasers, but there's all these different things that they have to do, and they say, I don't want to sit here. I want to sit there. I don't want to do this. I want to unbuckle. I want to ride in the back of your truck, you know, in the bed, going home and throw things at people going down the road. Now, I love them. But love is not demonstrated by letting them do all those things. Love is demonstrated by following the safety and the things that God, that, well, not in this case, but God's ordained authority, the authority over me has said, this is what is good, this is what is safe for them. Well, in the same way, I don't love other Christians by just saying, good on you, have a great day. I love Christians, I love other Christians by first obeying God myself. Now notice what he's going to say in verse number eight. Notice what he says, and this is important. Notice what he says, look to who? Yourselves. So he's not saying love others by making sure they obey all of God's commands. That will come and there's influence with it. <laughs> he says first love others by you obeying all of God's commands. Sometimes we're frustrated when someone's in error or there's a mistake or we feel like someone's struggling in a certain area of their life. Spiritually, we want to help them. Well, God's instruction here is that we first look to our own lives. Now, it doesn't mean I have to attain perfection before I can ever help someone. But it does mean that before I speak a word to them, I should probably look internally and see, am I obeying the clear written commands of God from Scripture? And if I am not, then maybe we both need to go to the Lord together. Notice the next. This is a caution both against overcorrection, but also a reminder that love and truth are not to be separated. I think he starts with this. Notice he doesn't start his letter by saying, don't let false teachers in, don't support and accept them. He doesn't start with that. He starts with love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, some of these false teachers are saying that they are brothers and sisters in Christ. I think that what they're teaching and what they're evidencing is, is shows that they are not brothers and sisters in Christ. But he says, she sa he says to her first, now you don't reject, you don't kick them out, you don't, you don't be mean to them, you don't abuse them, you don't physically attack them. He says, you do love others, but you love others by following and obeying your God. And so then he proceeds. So he says, you're guided by truth. Then he says, you're also guarded by truth. What are you guarded from? Verse number seven. For many deceivers are entered into the world. Notice this, who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Notice the immediate context. We've already covered it. The immediate context of 2 John is toward these traveling teachers in a day can you imagine in a day with no media, no social media, no email, no phone calls, no text messages, this glorious day in which they live in some ways, I get it. But someone could come into their community of Christians and say, I'm a Christian too. And they would know enough about this Christ and the apostles to worm their way in. But it could be said the Christians were known for their hospitality, especially toward each other. There's certain elements of certain types of towns and certain things. There, it, it wasn't Holiday Inn Express on every corner that you could go to and just safely stay there for a nominal fee. I mean, there was difficulty in traveling in the world in that day. So Christians were overly generous to one another, which was a good thing. It was a statement of their hospitality. They're obeying God's commands. But some people had learned that and had begun to abuse it. And they would come in and they would teach, but they were not teaching what the apostles taught. They were not teaching what Jesus taught. They would teach an element of Jesus, but then they would add to it whatever they wanted or whatever they felt personally on their own. Particularly notice the serious nature of which John says that they are teaching false things. It's not just any and every little thing. He's not talking, he didn't say that they're false teachers because they're, I, I could throw out any list of small deals or preferences or uh, ideology or methods. He's not talking about any of those things. He's talking about core doctrine. Notice, if you would, again, in verse number seven, what makes them false teachers or deceivers? 
they confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. They, they, Jesus is fully God, fully man. He is divine God of universe. But he is also mankind come to dwell among us. He is the picture of unity that God and man can be restored. And without that, there is no hope of you and I being restored. If God could not come in the form of a man and attain or make a sacrifice before God on his own behalf to die when he did not deserve to die, he did not have the punishment of sin on his life. He was sinless and perfect, and yet he died on our behalf. But if Jesus is not divine, he cannot keep God's law in that sense because he would be depraved just like you and I, affected by the fall of mankind and our sin. But if he is not man, then he cannot appease God's wrath either. And so these ones would come in and they would teach that God, there's a lot of different teachings out there. I'll give you some examples. You see on the next page, we won't study any of them in detail this evening. But I just want you to, here's a few of the heresies that had come up in the first and second centuries that these false teachers would quite often assert for one reason or another. And we've kind of given them titles or names. They didn't necessarily name them these things. Some of them were, some of them named after their uh, prominent teachers of the time. Adoptionism, which says Jesus was born as a normal man, but then God adopted him and made him special. Arianism, which says that Jesus was a lesser created being, that he himself is not divine, which some of these are not just first century heresies. Some of them, if you read websites of Jehovah's Witness and Mormons and some of the others, this is exactly what they believe. Docetism, which believes that Jesus was divine, but he only appeared to be human. He's like this morphing alien being almost that came, but he was not human like you and I. He just put on the appearance of being human. Gnosticism, which says all flesh is sinful. So Jesus had to have been more than just normal human flesh which then they would stretch and say, so there has a deeper understanding and an explanation that's needed. Well, who do you think gave the explanation? The false teacher did. Modelism, saying God is one person in three modes. And so sometimes he's God the Father, sometimes he's the Son. For 33 years he was the Son, and now he's the Spirit, and he's not the Trinity, as Scripture teaches. You don't have it written down there, but Nestorianism taught that Jesus' divine and human attributes existed separately, and so that he was God separately also from being man. And so he could do things like heal people when he was in his divine nature, but he could also do things like suffer and die on a cross when he was in his human nature. It takes away that God suffered and gave himself for us. You see some of the others here. We won't go through all of them, but notice subordinationism, Jesus is lesser than the Father in his essence or in his attributes. And there's all sorts of warnings about these in Scripture. But I want you to notice, this is just a small list of what popped up in the first couple hundred years after Jesus is born. But I want you to notice, Scripture does not try to address every false teaching that was going to come down the line. Scripture gives us truth. And then we are to balance and judge all other concepts by the truth. But some would abuse that. And some would come in and say, well, the Bible doesn't say this. I can tell you this. And they would add to Scripture. We're going to read Second Peter 2 in, in a few moments, so we'll move past that, but we'll come back to it in a few minutes. But it warns that heresies, it says that it seduce people away from Christ. So there's this warning to examine ourselves. Notice he says, look to yourselves. He does not say it look and examine every false teaching that ever you could find in any book or article or search online. He doesn't say examine every false teaching everywhere, but he says look to yourself and compare yourself with the truth of Scripture, that we lose not the things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. So what is their call? He calls them, don't follow false teaching. This is deceitful. It's anti-Christ. It's an anti-Christ. So what is the antidote to that? Verse number nine. 
Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Now here's the antidote to it. He that abideth in, lives in the truth or the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So there's this call to stay in the doctrine of Christ. You have a small note there. Well, what does that mean, the doctrine of Christ? Does that mean teaching about Jesus or does that mean the teaching of Jesus? Well, it, of course, means both. John himself in 2 John, uh, verse number 7, says, talks about the teaching about Christ. But he also, and you have a number of verses there, uh, in 1 John tells us that we should be following the teaching of Christ. So when we learn and follow what the Bible teaches about Jesus, and what the Bible teaches that Jesus taught, we're called to remain in that truth, not just to know it, but to trust it and submit to it, to not turn away from it. In verse number 10, or excuse me, verse number 9, Miss Prentheris there is actually in verse number 9, the word transgress or transgresseth, you know, they're the Greek word, parabino, it just means to go past, to go by the side of, to neglect or to step over something. So literally, he says, whoever goes past the teaching of Jesus, whoever steps over Jesus' teaching, whoever moves past or says that they have some added thing to give you beyond and above what Scripture does, he says to avoid those that are not abiding in the truth of Scripture. Now notice the last. <clears throat> so he says, you're guided by truth, you're guarded by truth, and then you give yourself to truth. This is his application. He kind of gives an explanation and he exposits. He tells, here's what you should be doing internally. Here's how you should teach or approach the truth. But then now he addresses this woman's issue. And I want you to notice that when we try to help others in our own lives, you have a, a child, a son, a daughter, a grandchild at some point. You have a parent or someone that is in error in their thinking about Scripture, or about life, or about God, or about Jesus. I want you to notice he does not spend the entire time addressing what she should do, the actual specific actions that she should take. He first teaches her the biblical principle. He says, God teaches us that we are to follow truth. And that when we follow truth, we will love him and we will love others. And that we love him and love others by obeying his commands. And if we're going to obey his commands, it means we're going to have to set aside things and people that teach against his commands. So in a second, John doesn't begin with, here's how you fix all these things that you're doing wrong, you bad person. He teaches first, here's what God's word teaches us. Now let me help you by showing you what that might look like in your own life. And it's a good principle or a pattern for us. Verse number 10, if there come any unto you, and I think he knew absolutely that they had, and bring not this doctrine. What doctrine? The teaching of Christ. If someone comes teaching against the doctrine and teachings and truth of Jesus, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. And, and the words there that he uses, so sometimes we, we look at the specifics of that. What does that mean? If someone doesn't teach Jesus or they teach the opposite of Jesus, does that mean we don't speak to them? We don't let them in our home. We don't go in the same room as them. We don't talk to them. It says wishing Godspeed. What does that mean? It just simply means to welcome or to receive, to wish well. In other words, to support. And I think it's fairly clear from the context. John is saying, don't give false teachers influence in your own life just because you're trying to be hospitable or because they're kind in return back to you or because they say something that you desire to hear. He says, we're not to open ourselves to the influence of others. Here's that, <coughs> that speak against Christ. So notice some principles, though. John here is not referring to all error. Now, we should try to stay grounded in Scripture, but there are elements in Scripture. There are certain things that, that are taught in Scripture that to be honest, sometimes the Christ, two different Christians can land in two different places. It doesn't mean that God is the author of chaos and he's just letting truth be whatever it is to different people. But notice the seriousness of the type of doctrine that John is talking about. He says, don't welcome people that don't teach what Jesus really is. Don't welcome people that teach against the gospel. He's not saying if you disagree with someone 
and you have a verse that you think supports your disagreement, then don't do anything with it. We would never have a church of more than like a person and a half if that was the case. It just it, it doesn't work that way. But sometimes when someone gets so frustrated with another Christian, they walk away from a relationship even with that Christian. But God's going to judge in yourselves the seriousness of this, and it's clear. He's not just referring to any mistake that someone makes. He's talking about false teaching, those that are proselytizing against the gospel. And if this is the case in their life, then you could make the argument that they're not Christians to begin with. So the context is... Don't give support to those that teach against Christ's truth. Then you notice on the back, the final things. It's not a command to turn away from all non-Christians. There are people that have done this at different points in time. Uh, there are different people that wrote, I won't, I won't go all the way into this for time, there, there's people that wrote some very beloved hymns in our hymn book. And I won't even tell you which ones because I don't want to, crush your souls. But uh, there's some very beloved hymns that we've even sung in the last few weeks that at the end of the author's life, he snapped, went nuts, took verses like this, moved to Israel and started a compound, tried to keep all, Christ all non-Christians or their view of Christians out, involved with polygamy and all this sort of kingdom type of setup, even within human beings, just snapped and went nuts from misinterpreting something like this and saying, I shouldn't have anything to do with any non-Christian. How will we ever win a non-Christian if that's the case? It's not what he's calling for. He even tells us that in 3 John, chapter, or 3 John verse 5, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. So we're to show love, not just to Christians and run away from all that are not, but it means don't support false teachers in this way. Why? Because... It's the same as taking part in their evil deeds when we support those that teach against Christ. Now, you say, most of you in the last few days or last few evenings ha have not pulled out your phone and, and found some heretical, awful, apostasy type of teacher and donated $20 to them. Most of us have not done that. But there are things that we give our minds and hearts to, and it doesn't always have to be in the form of someone standing behind a lectern teaching us. It's what we allow into our hearts and lives that influences us. Think about the people that you listen to on a daily basis. And again, it's not saying just don't ever listen to words from non-Christians, period. How many of the shows that we watch, how many of the books that we read, how much of the news even that we take in? How much of the podcast that we... I'm trying to hit all of our bases here. When you hear someone that teaches against the teaching of Christ, so we, we are not to say, well, I'm going to pick and choose. He does a lot of good stuff, so I'm just going to ignore the fact that he's against Jesus. We're not called to do that. If you listen to the things that you watch and hear and listen to, or it, it could be any number of things. It could be the music that influences you. It could be any number of things that influence your life. If there is a mockery made of God and His Word, this is telling you, avoid. Do not welcome that into your life. Do not bring it into your children's life. Don't let it influence you. And it's saying here a distinct place of separation. Separate yourself from that. Don't bring it into your mind and into your home. John clearly calls us to walk in truth, love in truth, and abide in truth. So what is our relationship with God's word like? Because it's easy to stand and say, we don't like false teachers. But if we don't know the truth of God's word, how will we ever know who is false and who is not? I'm going to take two minutes and two or three minutes and, and finish here. I'm going to put a few things up on the screen. I just kind of added this a little last minute through the afternoon, but just some, some thoughts. What is it? Because what does it look like in our own life? What are some dangerous forms of false teaching in today's world? I don't have this on your notes. I can get it to you later if you want, or you can jot some of it down. For time's sake, we won't read all the scriptures tonight, but you can jot them down and follow along with them. But very simply tonight, there's number one, there's, there's the heretic or heresy. 
which simply tampers with the faith that is given to us. The Bible says that the faith was once given to all. Given to all once. This is what it says in Jude uh, verse number 3. It tells us that that faith was given to us. So to say that that faith has now changed, which is exactly what some of the early century false teachers would do, they would come into someone's life and they would say, now you know this from the Bible or about Jesus, but God told me something else that you need to know. Or you haven't arrived until you do this. So there's direct heresy, but then there's some other things. There's the charlatan. This is the person that grabs on to spiritual and Christian things, but they do it for their own gain. They do it for their own enrichment. They do it for their own networking. They do it for their own wallet, their own pocket. And you can hear and sense some of that because they will consistently lead away from the gospel. Or if they include the gospel, once they get you through the gospel, they quickly run somewhere else other than scripture. And there's a lot of, I could give you a lot of examples. I won't for time's sake tonight. Then there's the prophet. This is the person that has a special word from the Lord that no one else has. That is beyond Scripture. Revelation warns us of those that will add to God's Word and someone that says, God told me this. Now, that's one thing for the Holy Spirit to influence your life about your own personal life or even your influence on others. It is a different thing to claim that there is a word from God that has come to you that is authoritative over everyone else. And this is actually a lot more prevalent than you think in certain uh, areas or uh, veins of Christianity. Then there's the abuser. Not always as easily noticeable, but claims for himself those that he pretends to have watch and care over. They will use scripture, but they will use it for their own gain. They'll use it to abuse influence and authority. And it's a shame to say if this, this, is, this takes form not just in one vein of Christianity, not just in one denomination, but churches of all types and all kinds and all sizes all around the world. It, it's manifest itself in sexual abuse in the last, well, really all throughout different points of Christianity. And sometimes that's why people are turned off to Christianity because they see people that abuse God's word and the authority that it gives and they teach something apart from God's word, but it's benefits for themselves. There's the divider, the one who teaches against something because they don't like someone else. They desire discord. They undermine scripture to tell their point. There's the tickler. Now, that is a really weird term. Let me explain it to you quickly. It's not physically tickling. That's from 2 Timothy chapter 4, where it says they have itching ears. And it's when a man teaches not what God speaks in his word, but it's when a man teaches what other men want to hear. And that is a danger in that too. I could say names of prominent people like Joel Olstein or Stephen Furtick or some of the ones that you may see on your television tonight and that come across. But it takes all kinds of forms and shapes. It's not just a prosperity gospel. It's telling any type of people who they want to hear. There's a prominent pastor in uh, the Dallas, I think it's the Dallas area. I will say that his name is, I'll just say his name is Robert Jeffries, and he is extremely prominent right now. Everyone loves him. This conservative politician pastor who absolutely ignores the flaws of evil men and ignores scripture and calls that it is God's will on someone's life ignores sin completely to align it with someone's political desires. Now, I'm not saying that everything these people do are evil, and they are, but according to Scripture, it is against Christ, ignoring what God actually tells in His Word to say what they think of their own mind. This is the last one, the speculator. This is the one who does not dwell on God's Word, but dwells on everything that we don't know from God's Word that speculates on anything that's possible. They love anything that's original. They love anything that's novel or new to them that no one else knows. And there we should be warned against that as well. What should we ground ourselves to? Scripture itself. Not focused on the things that Scripture doesn't tell us and so we let our minds wander and imagine, 
but we are ground ourselves in what Scripture actually teaches. And we don't give influence to these things in our lives on a regular basis. Let's ask Him to help us and commit ourselves to it. Jesus, thank you for your word tonight. It's good and holy and righteous. We pray that we would ground ourselves in truth, that we would not ignore the gospel, we would not ignore what your word teaches about sin, but that we would follow it and that we would obey it, that we would not ignore uh, the flaws of our own lives first, but then even ignore the flaws of others that we prefer or like, but highlight the mistakes and flaws of others who we don't. Lord, your word has given us principle into how we can handle truth and that we are to do it with love and that we love best, we love others best when we love you most and we love you most when we obey your commands. And we pray that we would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close <clears throat> this evening, if you would, in a, a time of prayer in the next four or five minutes. And if you would, uh, look at your prayer list there. You see at the top, and this may be uh, a new news to some of you, but you see there at the top of the prayer request tonight for the family of Judy Knapp. Um, this is Dr. Knapp's wife, and you know she's had some health issues over the last um, couple years, but um, this is Jack Yearns' mother. She passed away this morning. Uh, several of you asked about funeral services and arrangements. Uh, you remember for Mrs. Knapp's parents, they kind of did the same thing. There's just going to be a funeral service just for family at the Knapp home a little later this week. And so as you get the opportunity, I hope that you will uh, share your love and condolences with them. Um, the family wants to be here Sunday. If they are, I hope that you'll uh, greet them and, and share a word of uh, love with them as well. Uh, we've checked and asked about helping with, with food and that kind of thing, and, and all of that is taken care of for uh, the moment. If you have any other questions, you can uh, contact me or um, call the office, and we'll get you directed in the right way. But if you would, uh, be in prayer for the family of Mrs. Knapp and uh, the funeral service that they'll have there for their family uh, this weekend. Uh, a few others that have been here for a number of weeks continuing to pray, pray for Patricia Wilman that she recovers from her uh, shoulder surgery replacement she had last week. Uh, Judy Miller called in with a request for her, this is actually her great niece, uh, but Jennifer Clifton, you have the name there, she's having surgery for a brain tumor on Monday. And then um, Gail Sharon's neighbors you see there at the bottom, I believe came home, is that right? He's home, okay, so he's Okay, so be in prayer for both of them, and then uh, praying for Laurie Klima. This is Mary Martin's daughter who's going through uh, cancer treatments at the moment. All right, let's be in prayer together there tonight as families, couples, and uh, you pray out loud there, asking the Lord to uh, bless and work in these individuals' lives and also in our church and our congregation and church family.